welcome back again to CPP Chat, a strongly guaranteed look at what's going on in the world of C++, chatting the guests from the community. But before we get to where today's guest has been for the last decade, John needs to make a disclaimer. John. Thank you, Phil. Whilst CPP Chat has used its best endeavor to make sure that all the English information, data, documentation, and other material, copy, and images on this website are accurate and complete, it does not accept liability for any errors or omissions. CPP Chat or any of its hosts or guests will not be liable for any claims or losses of any nature arising directly or indirectly from the use of the information, data, documentation, or other material on this website. So with that aside, um, I'm going to introduce Dave, and then we're going to discuss some of the news, uh, the news coming up for C++ people. Uh, so our guest today is Dave Abrahams, who has been uh, an inspiration and a mentor to me personally and a personal friend. And so I'm so delighted to have him uh, on the show. And also, as as Phil kind of hinted about, he's he's not been active in the C++ community, uh, and he's he's back, and we're excited to have him back. So I can't wait to talk about that. But Let's, oh, Michael says hi, Dave. Um, uh, so hi, let's Michael. talk about some news coming up. What do we have coming up, Phil? Oh, what haven't we got coming up? So as we get to the end of this year, all the conferences for next year are starting to open up. Um, starting with C++ on C, that's uh, so my conference. I uh, just announced the dates today, so breaking news, uh, dates and keynote speakers. So. It's going to be running in July from the 4th of July to the, um, I got this wrong earlier. What did I say? The 7th. <laughs> the 7th. Um, I should check that myself. And yeah, starting on the 4th of July. You didn't hear that wrong. And the keynote speakers, we've got uh, Jason Turner, uh, Hannah Dusikova, and Kevin Henney. So um, I'll put a link in the show notes to the announcement for that. And we'll be opening call for speakers and, and tickets in the new year. So it's just a heads up at this point. Very good. And there's, there's uh, going to be, sorry, what was that? I was just going to ask you, we can't register yet. Not Registration's yet, no, not no. open. Okay, okay. No, no. Uh, but, you know, patience, patience, John. Yeah. Gonna get that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's going to be another new conference uh, next year, actually just after C++ on C, exactly two weeks after uh, C++ North going to be running in Toronto. It's been uh, uh, in the planning stages for a while now, so I'm, I'm expecting big things. Um, I've been to, to get there. And I think their call for speakers is going to be opening on January the 24th. So, uh, so watch for that one as well. And talking of call for speakers being open, I believe C++ Now is, is open yes. to submissions. Is that right? Right. C++ Now call for submissions. Um, I believe we're ending the call for submissions about the time that C++ North has, is, um, is opening there. So get your, get your submissions in real quick. Um, and so uh, uh, this is, of course, C++ Now, a conference that Dave knows a lot about because he started this conference <laughs> under a different name at the time, yeah. but, uh, but started the conference. Um, and um, do you think we can get you to come back to Aspen uh, this year, Dave? I'm already on the hook, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, we hadn't announced that yet. We were gonna, oh, okay. I was going to tease well, him a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe. If you twist maybe. my arm, <laughs> you might be able to get me to go to Aspen. It's only one of my favorite places, you know. <laughs> yes, good job. This is not going out live. We can just edit that bit out. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, we won't tell anybody about that. <laughs> Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be great to have you back. Um, it's uh, it is uh, still a wonderful conference, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna enjoy it. it you know, it's it's the uh, I don't know I don't know what to say. I I run another conference. I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, C plus plus now is clearly the best. The environment, which you had, you're the one who selected the the location. Um, that's not all of it, of course. It's also uh, the uh, the community that's there and the uh, kind of the design of the conference from the point of view of very long talks, very long breaks, um, giving people the opportunity to uh, um, to get to know each other and stuff like that. Um, when you 
when you did this, did you have a conference in mind that you patterned this after? Or, you know, I've never asked you this kind of stuff because, oh, you know, th the first time I met you was we, we, you know, I went to the conference and, mm. you know, I just kind of took it as a given. And then um, my role became, you know, bigger and bigger. And we never really talked about how it started or, you know, why you made the decisions you made, which clearly have been quite successful and worked out well, but we never really talked about it. Yeah, well, um, I can tell you a couple of things. Um, I have to credit Scott Myers uh, because because when I was getting ready to do this conference, I, I think it must have been at the old, uh, what did they call that? There was that conference in Santa Clara that... that uh, SD West. SD West, yeah. It might have been might have been at SD West that I, I got a chance to pick Scott's brain. And, and the thing that I remember most is he said, listen, just think about what you want the conference to be like. You know, I, he said, you know, I know a guy who runs a conference every year and he loves to hike. And so a hike is part of the conference. And I was like, Oh yeah, this doesn't have to just be you know the the rote thing. I don't I don't have to think about it the same way that uh, that you know people think about most conferences. It, I should really think about what inspires me, and and yeah, I did pattern it pattern it off of something, um, which is the the Aspen Center for Physics has a, a summer long conference basically. Um, so that's when their when their summer session is. Physicists come from all over the world. They, you know, have a, a residence residency there for the summer, and there's all of this amazing collaboration going on. And they give talks to each other so that and spread the spread the information around. You know, there's one. Uh, they they also have a a weekly picnic, which was basically the the uh, inspiration for the picnic that we do um, at that conference every year. Clearly, um, one of the high points. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. During the summer, the the physicists usually have you know those little streams that run through the campus. That yeah. They usually uh, put a couple of watermelons in the streams, and they're that's <laughs> that's how they're they're kept cool until the until they're ready to cut them open. Um, and, uh, I, I was just thinking there's one thing that they do that, that maybe now that, now that C++ now is well established, we ought to think about doing, even though the, the town is pretty empty at that point. One of the things that the, uh, physicists do is they give a public lecture. They, they oh. nominate somebody to give a, a lecture that's at a, that's at a, you know, accessible to a lay person uh right. level and right. they they do that over at the wheeler opera house um and uh yeah that's a that's a really cool thing that they do you know there's one or two every summer i guess that's that is an amazing idea i mean obviously it'd have to be the right i'm not certain that most aspen residents care about operator overloading but they certainly would think about we could talk about design and you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that we could say, yeah, we're the right speaker, particularly. Yeah. We'll yeah. I mean, I, I doubt that the average Aspen resident cares about quantum mechanics either, but you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Well, I don't know. It cares about, it understands. And that's the thing is if mm -hmm. you can, if you can make it relatable, I think a lot of people would care about quantum mechanics. They're just put off by the way you know, usually the way it's discussed is at a very high level. Nobody talks about, you know, quantum mechanics for dummies because, well, <laughs> it's just, I bet that you know, book exists. It probably does. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. All right. Um, anyway, so um, are there other announcements we want to make? Um, uh, ACCU, did, uh, do we have? Um, yeah. So I, I should say uh, the dates as well. Uh, May. First through sixth, I think yeah. we have dates for uh, for C plus plus now, and we yes. don't have registration open, but we will be working on that very soon. Um, I will say we will be on site and on site only 
uh, we did virtual last year, which worked out well, but I really think it's a better conference on-site conference. The, the, the site is, is amazing and I think it works much better that way. So that's what our goal is. Um, and we have been in contact with the venue there. And essentially if we, well, let's just say the, the clearly the best option was to require that everyone show up, be vaccinated. Um, if we don't do that, there's a whole bunch of hoops we have to do go through uh, during the conference that we don't want to go through. So we're just going to ask that just like CPP con did, if you're going to be on site, which, you know, then you're going to have you to be are. vaccinated. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so that's the policy. And we will have registration open up very shortly. Uh, and all the conferences <clears throat> we've been talking about are all planning to be at least um, in person or in person first conferences and maybe some hybrid elements. And that goes for the ACCU conference as well that you, you started mentioning. That's going to be in April 6th to the um ninth i believe of april next year in uh, in bristol again in the uk uh right. the call for speakers for that has closed i believe the program is is basically done but not going to be announced until january i think is that right john i'm not sure um You're on the committee. i mean we we finished up the the, the selection a, a week and a half ago something like that two weeks ago uh but we've we haven't announced it or, I should say they haven't announced it. I'm not really involved in the announcement yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's usually <laughs> early January that gets announced. So you'll hear yeah. more about it then. But um, from what I've heard, that's going to be another, another great conference as well. In fact, I think the first yeah. time I, well, the, only time, the only time I ever met Dave in person was at an ACC conference back in the early 2000s. So there we go. I hope I wasn't too much of a jerk. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> No comment. Okay. <laughs> I get the picture. Uh, no, 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 it was good. Do we, uh, do we have other things we need to talk about on the news front here? Um, there was a little, um, now I'm no longer working at the JetBrains. It would be easy for me to scope over, skip over the JetBrains news, but they actually had a couple of really big announcements just recently that is worth bringing up. Um, uh, they introduced remote development to uh, all their IDEs, so full remote development. Um, but also then as a follow-up announcement, they've announced like a next generation distributed IDE uh, called Fleet, which is sort of in beta at the moment, but it's going to be potentially a big thing uh, in the future. So yeah, pretty big announcement there. I'll, I'll put some links to those in the uh, in the show notes. Um, I was When I was working at JetBrains, that was all secret stuff that I couldn't talk about. So it's, uh, <laughs> so it's quite fun now to be able to talk about it from the outside. All right. So we need to arrange to have Anastasia on to. Yeah, we should we should do that. To know okay, and uh, and, and Timo actually, who's taken. So if, my role. if you're not there, where are you? So I am now at Sonos Source, do uh, static analysis tools. We'll get some guys on from uh, from the team there as well in the future. Um, and I, I just put out a new blog post on the the Sonos Source blog. Just recently on uh, some C plus plus twenty features that we've uh, we've got some new rules rules for, and it's um, been generating a bit of interest. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in in the notes as well. Okay, very good, very good. All right. So <clears throat> I guess my first question to Dave is, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> well, I I fell into the the deep hole that is called Apple for a long time, um, and uh, you know when you when you go to work at Apple, uh, they, uh, if you're an engineer, they don't want you to talk to anybody. Um, and, uh, and that's changed a little bit for the people that work on the, the Swift team, which is what I went to do. But, uh, but that changed sort of after I, after I left the Swift team. Um, so, uh, for the most part, Apple, uh, likes their engineers to only speak at WWDC. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's the contact I've had basically. So, I, you know, to, to fill in the picture, uh, I uh, joined Apple in 2013 to develop a new programming language. Um, that was a, a, it ended up, it was the programming language called Swift. Um, mm -hmm. 
that was a, a rare opportunity to uh, work on a programming language project that was, you know, like really likely to succeed. Um, you know, because programming languages come and go every week, you know, and mm -hmm. they just kind of die in obscurity. Um, but, uh, you know, my friend Doug Greger was on this team and uh, Chris Latner was running the team. And, uh, you know, this was, uh, there were, uh, there was a lot of major talent already uh, in place. Uh, and, and it was a, it was a great mission because we wanted to change the world for all of the programmers that program for Apple platforms. So, which would have included me, except we were off by a few years. You know, I was a Mac developer, um, mm. but I was no longer a Mac developer by the time Swift came along. Um, but uh, I, I never really have had a chance to ask you about this kind of stuff. How... I mean, I mean, the idea of being able to work on a new language, like you say, that's pretty, pretty exciting. But of course, new languages are a dime a dozen. But you knew this one was was going to have every possible op, um, opportunity to succeed because you're you're going to have um, a, a lot of investment from Apple's point of view. You're going to see a lot of developers jumping on right away. So, um, you know, even if it, it, it worst case it's still going to be a big splash, no question. And so uh, so I can see why that's a very attractive opportunity. How much, um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, make, I wanna say this in a way that I'm not trying to be, um, I just wanna say how much of an impact did you have? And by that, what I mean is how far along was the language def defined before you joined? How much, how, you, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, um, there was, well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say defined. I mean, you know, there was a there was a uh, a implementation of what had been sort of decided on up to that point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was broken. Um, uh, a lot of things, you know, barely worked. Uh, there was there there was a generic system, but um, but that was especially one of the parts that that really barely worked. Um, uh, there was no there was no mutability model, uh, so there was no way to say you know this this is a mutating method, this is a non mutating method. Um, there was no way I think yeah I think there was no way to say this is an immutable. Um, you know, constant, uh, uh, and uh, and most notably, there was almost nothing in the standard library. So the standard library was it, it has an interesting role in Swift because because in Swift the idea is to not have any primitive types. So the standard library is implemented in terms of of raw LLVM primitives, basically, that are imported into, into Swift for the use of the standard library. But the idea is that the standard library exposes all, you know, the first class types written in terms of those primitives. So there was probably an int and maybe a double. And, uh, and there was this, you know, partly implemented array that was basically enough to to you know prove out some parts of the the front end and that's sort of what was there um there were there were lots of philosophical ideas about no hang on let me ask you this question uh, uh, so so int is actually in the library yeah everything's yeah. in the library everything's now, in the library yeah. Um, and so when you're saying they were, they were probably there at that time, or they were there, you're saying they were, they were implemented even then as part of the library. So the library wasn't very much yet, but, but yeah. those, but that was from the beginning. That was the idea is that there's no such thing as what a C programmer would see as an int or a double. It's effectively STD int and STD double. They're part of the library. Yeah. I mean, to, to, uh, frame it a little bit differently, the, 
the philosophy was let's not reserve any special privileges for the library that we don't allow programmers to to take advantage of so let's right. find a way to to make sure that programmers can can write anything that the library writes and one of the things about about having no primitive types is that you have no you know there's no special category uh for which you know parts of the language need to act differently um so yeah um and probably another another piece that was that was surely uh surely must have existed at that point um to a fairly good degree was the interoperability with objective c so classes in in swift are classes are reference semantic things that are reference counted like like objective c classes are and uh and yeah so things like array and int are structs in swift wow interesting so the interoperability uh, well, with objective c was sort of like a foundational requirement because all of Apple's APIs were in Objective C, so you had to be able to import them and use them sort of directly. So, so that's why I'm saying it. It must have been there. Um, mm -hmm. My need to to do much of that was pretty limited in my in my job there. I didn't really have to interoperate with much Objective C except for the foundation classes because that there's already uh, was a, a framework called Foundation. For Objective C that that had its own array and its own dictionary and its own string and those things needed to interoperate with the with the Swift entities. So that's where those are the things that I mostly got um, the places where I mostly had to like think about Objective C interoperability. So you mentioned generics. Is that something that you? Uh, particularly were focused on and excited about or were you saying hey I've done enough template stuff in C++ I'm going to work on other stuff or well both I think <laughs> um, it, you know so well, let's see <laughs> when I just about this time was shortly after uh, this was 2013 was shortly after the um, the first concepts effort uh sort of failed in frankfurt and that was uh well yeah <laughs> i've done a little bit i've done a little bit with templates that's true um <laughs> for those so of you first, who are listening to audio phil was just holding up dave's book on the template metaprogramming so. i'll put it in the chapter up sorry carry the, on uh so the so the first concept effort uh was something that that Doug Greger uh, really put an enormous amount of energy into, and uh, and uh, drove it, and it was it was kind of scuttled in a most ignominious way uh, at mm -hmm. the last minute, um, and uh, and so he, you know, being on the Swift team, he really wanted to see that vision kind of play out and one of the most important things uh he thought about about the, a generic system is that a generic component function type whatever mm -hmm. should be separately checked in other words it should be you should be able to see if it's going to have errors in it without instantiating it and that's that was a foundational prim principle of the concepts of work that he had been doing in C++ originally. And um, Which yeah, did were, not make it. it concepts yeah. now in the language doesn't have that feature. That's an important missing feature. Oh, it's, it's critical. It's like, it's like, so, you know, con the concepts feature doesn't do anything for generic programmers because okay generic programmers don't get their code checked. So they have to figure out what the requirements of their code are and hope that they guess right and and annotate them on the on the types. And then users, you know, will try to use their their templates today with 
with their own types. And if they happen to match the specified concepts, then the compiler will try to compile the inside of the template. And if the template author made some kind of a mistake there, error inside the template, which is just exactly what concepts are supposed to prevent, right? Right. So, so, so to, so to, so to get into specifics, what we're saying is that you can, you can with concepts say, I need a concept of a type that supports addition and subtraction. And mm -hmm. if you call that um, with, with some type that doesn't support addition and subtraction, you get it, you get an error. But if you implement something that uses multiplication uh, in C++, you won't get an error uh, until it's, until it tries to instantiate it. But that's what was built into the original Doug had originally built in the original concepts was that the checking was not only on the caller, but also on the template itself to make certain that when you said, I need to create a concept that supports this idea, then you don't in your template do anything that's outside of that idea. Right, right. And so, um, you know, just for anybody who's thinking, well, how could that possibly work? Um, I, I need to clarify that because C++ is so undisciplined about, about g things matching up generically. In other words, there are open overload sets and overloads have to be resolved, you know, based on the type that's the thing is being instantiated with. And there are partial specializations and you can specialize, you know, vector of, of foo to be anything at all you want it to be, right? Um, because of all of those things, there has to, has to be in C++ when you do this, uh, a final round of checking to, you know, to make sure that one of these wacky things hasn't hasn't broken your your generic right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's in C++ there's still instantiation, still has to do all of that check it again. But there was a at least in Doug's design there was a robust first layer of checking. That would that would make sure that the operations you use in your template match up with those in the concept. Okay, um, and so Doug really wanted to to realize this vision in Swift, and uh, to me, this had always you know it had always been a passion of mine to do generic programming with tools that actually supported it well. Um, right. So I was I was really excited about, about building a generic library uh, for Swift uh, using a generic system that had true separate checking. Now, Swift doesn't do uh, an instantiation phase except as an optimization. And so one of the, the great things about the system is that you know, when your generic is checked, it figures out which overloads are, are getting used and and it knows sort of about the the um, all of the properties of the type parameter. So you can actually reason about the the semantics of the generic just on its own basis without even you know, it's nothing nothing crazy is gonna change just because you pass it a particular type. Um, Okay, um, but I, I should also say this is very different from what was covered in that book. And um, if you read, if you read Alex Stepanov, he will, yeah, he will. Uh, you can f find at least one place where he very prominently says, you know, generic programming is not template metaprogramming. Template metaprogramming is actually actually depends on on those wacky undisciplined features of C++ right. the the ability for a specialization to be unlike the you know the unspecialized thing the the general template um, things like that it, it you know those techniques all get used over and over again to make template metaprogramming work and what you know Alex was was interested in something much deeper. Um, he wasn't even interested in language mechanism. He was interested in raising algorithms to their 
highest level of abstraction without loss of efficiency, right? That's the that's the sort of capsule summary of generic programming. And right. I still, you know, I still long to realize Alex's vision. Um, so that's why I was excited about being able to use this system in Swift. So how 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 close did Swift come to being able to do that? I, I'm not um, very knowledgeable <laughs> about Swift, so I yeah, um, I would say I would say that there are some there are some still some limitations, and uh, and the without loss of efficiency story is is a very uh, somewhat complex one, uh, which I, I'd like to say a little bit more about. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, let's let's talk about that part first because I, that's the part I think that that Alex would have had the most concern with. So as I as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, Swift was supposed to be a replacement for Objective C, and one of the you know Objective C had many awful qualities, but <laughs> it did have one absolutely critical quality for Apple, which was that essentially the API boundaries were all dynamically dispatched. And because those things were dynamically dispatched, they were they were dispatched basically, like if you call the method, it was the moral equivalent of looking up the method name in some table and and finding the function pointer and invoking that. Right, because because of that that uh, you know uh, that abstraction boundary, what they were able to do was uh, let people update their applications, and Apple update its OS software completely separately, without breaking the the interface. So you could think about it as as you know, the same kind of thing that happens if you have type erasure at at your application boundary, and uh, and uh, you just agree to have a stable API, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, and that's basically the convention that they that they used to to ensure this stability. So, so what does this mean? What this means is that that if you want to be able to upgrade the OS and not break an application, you you do have to have types hidden from the the application so that so that information about the layout and things like that don't get compiled into the application. Okay. There has to be a level of indirection there. Right. And and so this is part of Okay, so so you don't need this kind of isolation boundary everywhere, but between the OS and the application, you do, and so that's a that's kind of a uh, a fundamental capability built into Swift called resiliency. So in resi in Swift, you make a struct unless you s say that that struct unless you declare it to be frozen, or or say to the to the compiler that you're exposing its layout, it will actually create type erasure around that boundary between your module and and the next module. So it's kind of like uh, the pimple idiom is built in essentially to the language. Yeah, that's one one way to look at it. It's not quite pimple because right, sure, struct, sure, but it's a struct doesn't require dynamic allocation, even though it can change its layout. Um, so what it has instead is there's information about its size and and you know all of the access to members is done through if they're public members it's done through accessors. Uh -huh. Right? And right. and so there's informa information encoded about where to find those but yeah. So um but so in, what, internally what if I was generics I was just going to say, as an app developer, if I was saying, well, you know, that's 
that's the price I pay to make an, an OS call. But internally, I w want to avoid that. But I have that option. I can say, yeah, for all of my use, this is frozen. Is that what you said? Or whatever it is. It's, so yeah. I'm going to allow uh, essentially, you know, this is the problem that, that we're suffering from a big, huge problem in the C++ world is this whole, you know, uh, binary compatibility situation. And as long as you have source and as long as you're building from source, it's never an issue. And your compiler can make all sorts of optimizing assumptions and all sorts of stuff like that. And you don't mm -hmm. break, but uh, it doesn't have what you called resiliency, right? It doesn't yeah. have that. Okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. I so, didn't mean to, I just, okay. To, yeah. So, so that's, that idea is built into the foundations of Swift, but fortunately you don't have to label every type frozen. Most people are compiling in a mode where, where they don't care about resiliency boundaries except for the ones exposed by modules that they use. So the modules that they use that come from the OS vendor, for example, uh, have a resiliency boundary, right? And at a resiliency boundary, what, do, what does this mean? How do we implement a generic across the resiliency boundary? Because you can't, you don't get to see the details of the types. Well, it means fundamentally, remember this is like built into the, into the base level of, of Swift. Let, let me back up a second. Let's say we want the language to work just one way, right? And then we want to then we want to optimize the cases that that need to be fast, right? So if we don't want to change the language semantics between the between the resilient case and the non-resilient case, we have to pick one as a sort of a canonical canonical uh, semantics, right? And so that means that the that the way that generics are realized, you know, before you start optimizing the code is all through a dynamic dispatch table, even though it's mm -hmm. statically polymorphic in the same way that C++ templates are statically polymorphic. It uses a dynamic dispatch mechanism to actually implement that. So let me, let me be a little bit more uh, specific. Um, one of the things that that we do in Swift that uh, you know was a, a reason that that the original concepts proposal didn't win in C++ is that we require when a type conforms to a concept, which we call a protocol in, in Swift, you declare that just the way you would declare something inheriting from a base class. It's not not a complicated declaration, you know, it's just a colon and-, and This thing. models so, this protocol. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, uh, and so what does that mean? That means that the protocol has a set of requirements and that set of requirements maps onto essentially a dispatch table, just like, just like a V table for a base class. And when you declare that conformance, the compiler, you know, basically fills up that table. So that's how the, that's how generics work at a fundamental level before the optimizer kicks in. Now the optimizer is when it can see through the, you know, both modules, it can specialize that into, into something where there's no, uh, no function indirection, right? So what's the problem with that in terms of no loss of efficiency? Well, the problem with that is that, that optimizers are, uh, are not a guaranteed thing. Right. They're not, sure. and, and it's a black art how to do optimization, right? So they, they do a bunch of passes and you know, this optimizer was written initially by people with a lot of experience with C++ optimizers and didn't, I think that part of it is that they didn't really have a, a swift perspective. You probably could have done better uh, way back when, uh, if you'd had, if you'd had sort of a broader perspective about how optimization is done, but a lot of things 
have historically depended on like how much inlining the optimizer actually does before before it starts to try and make conclusions about specialization, mm -hmm. right? You shouldn't have to inline things in order to specialize if you can see both sides of the the source. You right. should be able to turn that into a function call, right? But yeah. the way the optimizer was constructed, you know, that was one of those limitations. And so Swift has has uh, slowly been clawing its way back from a kind of a disadvantaged position in terms of its ability to remove abstraction penalty. You can, and and so what that means is uh, in practice, a lot of code, you know, will compile to extremely efficient code, sometimes even f more efficient than C++ for reasons I can get into. Um, but there's a level of complexity at which you will often run into a cliff where the optimizer says, oh, you know, I can't, I can't reason about this much code. And now I'm inserting a dynamic dispatch and that'll kill your performance. Right. Well, I think so that if, you, if it's a small operation behind that dispatch. I think particularly, I don't, I don't really know where we're at now, but my understanding was that with a lot of situations with the early early implementations of the compiler chewing on uh, the STL that abstraction penalty existed that theoretically should not have. The compiler should have been able to see through all this and inline everything, and it should just be, and in my mind, it does. I'm looking at that and say, oh, the compiler is just gonna do this and this and this. But in practice, there were limits, and then there was, uh, you know, and I-, I And if I yeah. believe Sean, there still are limits that, that are really quite shocking, like, like, you know, there are, there are types that you, if you're just gonna, if you're just gonna have an int or a float, you shouldn't wrap that in a struct because for whatever reason, the compiler can't, can't eliminate the abstraction penalty of that struct. And what you should do instead is like make a enum class or something like that. I see. This is, well, this is what yeah, I've heard. I've I've heard of stuff like uh, unique pointers, even though it's really just a pointer in size that the compiler sometimes won't pass it in a register simply because its type is not just a raw pointer. It's you know, so yeah. um, and, yeah, and exactly. I say it's, like it's that. yeah. You, on the one hand, I can wrap my head around that that is, but on the other hand, I just assume mm -hmm. the compiler is going to do the perfect thing because. Frankly, compilers are so damn impressive. <laughs> I give them a lot more credit than they probably deserve. Um, yeah, they are pretty great. So, uh, so let me. Um, I think that's part I, of the strength of C plus plus is that it relies so much on what the compiler. I mean, you know, the, the we expect so much of the compiler, but it, it but a well designed compiler really can deliver on a lot of that, and it makes it makes it easier for us to think at a higher level and still get performance. But go ahead and yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to actually point at one of those things that that actually kind of hamstrings C++ in terms of its compiler being able to give you all of the performance you deserve, which is that that every mutation in C++ is done, you know, above the level of int, is done through an unsafe pointer. And that means, what that means is that if you mutate a thing and then call some function you can't see through and then come back and look at that thing again, there's very often no way of the compiler knowing that that thing that you mutated is has the same value. Right. Right? Right. right. And, right. and so it ends up, so, so basically, why doesn't it know that? Well, because there's, this idea that the the address of that thing could have escaped somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, it could have escaped through that mutation you did, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 now it might be shared, and so that that function that you called, that opaque function, might have might be accessing through that that pointer, right? And this is this is a way that sort of C plus plus it's a little bit confounding because you know one of the things I love about C++ is that is that it takes value semantics seriously. 
right? It was one of the right. few serious languages that where, you know, your array, well, not your array, but your, your vector is a value, right? Mm -hmm. your, your standard way of representing a, a vector. And yet it gets undermined by the fact by two different things. One, the fact that uh, the fact that all mutations happen through pointers or references, but it, you know those are yeah. convertible, so that that's sort of a wash. And uh, and the other one is the eager copying behavior. So to pass a vector by value, right? You it ends up getting copied. And so nobody wants to pass by value anymore, right? Right. So what, mm -hmm. what they do instead is they pass by const reference. And that's sort of, that's what that means is, you know, I, I'd like to pass by value, but I can't afford it, right? But one of the things we don't know about a const reference, again, is... Is it really do you const? Actually is it being changed behind yeah. the back? Yes, Yeah. Exactly. Do you actually have the only reference to that thing? Or is somebody yeah. else, you don't know, right? right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and so, so that's a that's a big frustration, and that's one of those things that got got um, you know addressed in Swift. And I've been actually I've been involved in an ongoing exploration of of you know the meaning of value semantics uh, that's kind of all been inspired by by what happened with Swift. Finally, you know, writing research papers and things like that recently. So um, while you were gone, Herb gave a talk on um, on passing parameters where he kind of proposed this idea where instead of having the user decide, am I passing this by copy or by const ref, I just specify this is an input parameter, input only parameter. And that lets the compiler then figure out, oh, I'm just going to make a copy or am I going to, you know, which is essentially what Pascal does, I think. Um, and the the thing about this that that I thought about was, well, the problem is, how does the compiler know that the thing it's going to now make a const reference of is actually not going to be changed? Right now, that burden is on the call okay. because if you pass in a const ref and then somehow that object can be changed because of something else you passed in, you pass in a lambda that changes the object or whatever, however you do that, that's on you because you understand yep. that. But if you actually specify and say, no, this is an input parameter, and then the compiler just says, oh, well, I'll just implicitly make it a const ref because I don't want to make a copy of it. Well, whose responsibility now is it to make certain that it actually is const and not modified? And that's well, the problem, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, C++ doesn't, doesn't express our intent very well in this area, right? right. And, yeah. and I think the problem that Herb is solving is another important facet of this thing. It's not one of the ones I mentioned, right? Which is that you have to decide to pass things differently based on the type, right? The right. compiler right. can't decide for you today. Um, uh, but that wouldn't solve the problem that I talked about of, well, it came in by const ref. Okay, is anybody going to really change close. it? Right. And And one of the things about, yeah, um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. So <laughs> we'll find the next thing. Excuse me, Titan. Um, so one of the questions I wanted, to, one of the things I wanted to say is that I have, um, when I see language, I, I, I'm not one of these people who collects languages. I don't know a lot of different languages, right? Um, I I tend to write a lot in Python because unless I uh, unless I need scale, uh, it's just quicker and easier for me to do stuff in Python. Uh, and obviously, I spend lots of time studying and working in C++. But I'm not really this guru of all these different languages. But when I've looked at other languages, one of the things it's like you try to improve on C++. But I kind of got the impression you didn't talk to a lot of people who really understand C++. In other words, you see this one little thing that you say, "Well, I don't like this, so I'm going to improve on it." But you were in a situation where, I mean, you're talking to Doug Gregor, you're talking to Chris, uh, and I assume there were other people on the team who really, really understood C++. And yeah. so 
uh, one of the questions I want to ask is, did you, did you ever have a situation where um, you looked back and you said, oh, shoot, we made the same mistake here that C++ made? Or did you really learn from all of the C++ mistakes? That's interesting. That's an interesting question. Uh, there's one place, there's one place I think uh, that that we made a same mistake that C++ made. But I'm not sure I know exactly what the right answer is, number one. And number two, I think a lot of people are not going to agree with me that it's a mistake in C++. Okay. But, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> what I think is totally open type-based overloading, that causes more problems than it's worth. That's a thing I regret about C++ and I regret about Swift. Okay, explain um, what you mean by that. So <clears throat> what I mean is, um, okay, so so let's just look at it from, from an API consumer's perspective. When there's an overload set, okay, you, let's, say there, let's say there are five overloads and you wanna use the function. How much documentation do you need to read? You need, well, you, you actually you need to read need all to read. five of them because exactly. you don't know which one could kick in because the overload rules are complicated as heck. Right, and they all might have different semantics, right? Right. You just, it, there's just no restriction, right? Now, in C++, there's no answer for this because because of uh, concepts not being separately checked, essentially. But but you could have said you could have said, well, let's tie this this set of functionality to a concept, right, or a protocol as you would do it in Swift, mm -hmm. right? Now there's now there's one thing to look at. I think I think the yeah, it's it's really great in principle that you could plug in just plug in a new overload to this overload set and and you know specify some some fraction of your functionality you know without declaring conformance to some some protocol that's that's convenient nice i don't know what but but the the amount of uncertainty it causes i think is is far outweighs the the benefits of it. So, can you give me a really concrete example, and so I would understand that better? Um, okay. Um, so, a, a lot of ways that this that this uh, becomes an issue has to do with argument dependent lookup. Okay. Um, okay. But you can you can construct the same problems without argument dependent lookup if you have the right language features. But let's let's just let's just put ourselves in a C plus plus world, right? Nobody qualifies every call that they make in practice. Yeah. Okay, some of some of us do because we we know there's a danger out there in principle, right? And and you know, but like. Broadly speaking, nobody does that, right? So, so you write a generic function, you call some function next to you, you know, that you define next door without any qualification. Somebody passes another parameter, and now there's an overload set between your function next door that was your helper function and their function that they defined in their own namespace or that defined was defined in the same namespace as the type parameter right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now and now maybe their function was a better match and now maybe their their function didn't have to have anything to do with your function just cuz it was called the same thing right it it could be you know there's draw draw might be you know one person is is actually putting stuff on the screen and the other person is like a cowboy drawing his gun, 
I see. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So I, I've always thought of this really as a feature. For example, uh, swap, which is defined in STD, but yeah. you might want your own implementation of swap. Mm -hmm. uh, not so important now that we have move semantics, but in the olden days, um, that's what we did. We, we would write our own swap for our type. And so we took advantage called, of this. Yeah. Right. You called an unqualified swap. You would say using STD swap, or you would say using boost swap, uh, or just call boost swap, which I, I think worked this way. It just did this, right? But the problem is, as you say, um, the same thing could be true that you write you write your algorithm that you want to use, and someone else has hijacked that without intending to, uh, because argument dependent lookup cheats on on namespaces, right? Right, and yeah, and so so now to to analyze the behavior of even calling swap, now you need to look at a bunch of overloads. Right, because maybe right. you're swapping to T stars. So there's the there's the unqualified overload, there's the the one for T star, and there's the one for in, in your own namespace for your particular type. Right. Yeah. You need to know that those all implement swap and it's completely ad hoc the connection between those. Right. So like the a more principled answer would be to say, okay, there's a regular concept. Right. Let's let's say swap is part of regular regular types. Right. And so when a type declares itself to conform to regular, it can provide a swap, and that gets plugged into the semantics for swap. It's not it's not just a free overload set. It's we're going to call the swap that's associated with regular. But well, well it could still be a, a, an independent implementation, but it's constrained to the protocol or the concepts uh, that were defined that it's that it's saying that it's modeling. The type is modeling this and yeah, therefore and it, it, it can't create its own swap that that doesn't that doesn't meet the same set of concepts. Right. And and at the use site you're saying, oh, I mean that swap from regular. Right? Right. And if it's implemented differently, it's fine as long as the as long as the constraints are the same. And we will assume that the semantics are the same, but but well, uh, at least we know the constraints are the same. Well, this is yeah. I mean, you know, this is part of the reason I think it's a good thing that to require declaration of conformance to concepts. So you know, you say I'm conforming to regular. You read the documentation for regular. You say, okay, what do I need to implement? Okay, here's swap. You know, it's got to have those semantics. Like if somebody right. doesn't match that up. That's a bug, but you know, like right. it's easy to, it's easy. You know, one of the things I, I, I loathe about the situation that happens with ADL is it's, it's really hard to figure out who to blame when something goes wrong. Sure. Whenever you have a language that where something can go wrong and you can't point the finger at somebody, you've got a problem because right. It means that the documentation, there's no way to write the documentation so that it's enough, right? Mm -hmm. I usually just blame John. Oh, <laughs> well, well, you're usually right. <laughs> so uh, earlier you were saying that uh, protocols were similar to the original C++ concepts. In the... Uh, in terms of their type checking properties, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the features of the original C++ concepts that we didn't get in C++20 was concept maps. And Swift has the equivalent of that in protocol extensions, which I think would also be relevant here with mm -hmm. your overloading problem. That, yep. that allows you to add new functionality, not only to an existing type, but to an existing protocol applied to a type. Or apply a yeah, protocol well, it is to a type after things. the fact. Yeah, it does two it does two different things. But the the main one being it allows you to say how a type conforms to a protocol post hoc. And actually the there are so there's there's actually a, another kind of regret point in the Swift design space that I keep going back and forth about. But um, but I think I regret having totally uh, totally open post hoc conformance. Post hoc conformance means means 
Module A defines protocol. Module B defines type. Module C makes type conform to protocol. Okay, and and the reason for that is that that can definitely cause some some ambiguity problems. Although I I still want scoped concept maps, so all of those same issues would come up. So maybe I don't regret that too much. <laughs> well, I think Rust has some constraints on what things can can apply where. Uh, yeah. that I think breaks that ambiguity. I, I forget the exact details now, but it's yeah. you can either do it locally or in a module, but not both, or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it gives you quite the power that you wanted at the same time, but mm. it's a trade-off yeah. you've got to make. Yeah, uh, there's another thing that that's uh, that Swift does that that I maybe maybe would have given up on uh, is uh, it doesn't require templates to be what's called monomorphizable, um, which means that that there are some templates that you you actually couldn't compile without a, a dynamic dispatch. Um, and that has to do with like long chains of associated types. It's a complicated uh, it's a complicated thing. But monomorphization is basically, you know, uh, inlining out the specialization of the of the template for a particular type, right? So there's there's no rule that that inlining wouldn't go on forever with Swift. So there's, so some some templates, uh, some generics, oddly, oddly, and very, very rare generics, but, but oddly, you can't actually like turn them into a completely statically dispatched thing. So um, we are, I'm not sure exactly when we started, but I think we're kind of at the point where you need to think about stopping. So I'm going to drop this really quick, really open-ended, huge question that we could spend another two hours talking about. But um, uh, so what are you and Sean doing? <laughs> ah, well, <clears throat> I, I have to take a, a moment to give a, a quick advertisement for working at Adobe. Um, Please do. This I I want to say this is of all the places I've worked definitely my favorite. Um, they are hiring C plus plus programmers, and you know this the kind of C plus plus programmers that watch this show are are the kind of people that get hired at Adobe. I've met the the most brilliant people I've worked with there, and the most equanimous. It's it's very I don't know. It, it, ecumenical in the way people deal with each other. Um, I'm, I'm extremely impressed with, with the collegiality. Um, and we're working on some really interesting and hard problems that are worth solving. Okay. That end of, end of advertisement. What we're doing, uh, Sean and I, is uh, we're restarting the Software Technology Lab, which you may know uh, as the source of a bunch of libraries that Sean mostly originated. Um, but uh, it inside of Adobe is basically uh, an applied research organization. We're under the uh, digital imaging department, which is basically where Photoshop lives, the you know one of the most important products in the in the company. And um, are this was the organization where alex worked that is that is true yes so the software technology lab was uh, in its earlier incarnation alex and alex stepanov and sean parent and uh a few other people uh uh foster breton i think um and matt marcus um and uh yeah so uh, so I'm very honored to be, to be in that you know select company. That's <laughs> that's one thing. Our mission in the Software Technology Lab is to improve the practice of programming, both inside and outside Adobe, through uh, research, uh, uh, tooling. So that means libraries and maybe compilers, uh, and um, 
and uh, education, right? So our and our first mission that we're that we're working on is basically a uh, a version of of Sean's Better Code series as a course uh, to be given internally. Um, we're of course I. You know, he he was very generous. He said, "I want you to put your stamp on this." So, so we've tossed out a bunch of things that he was saying or rewritten, reframed them. But you know, one of the wonderful things about working with Sean is like we fundamentally agree on all of the most important things, and so um, it's it's just been fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, you know, as someone who puts on events constantly looking for high quality speakers that want to educate the community. This sounds great to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, how, uh, how do you feel about that, Phil? <laughs> did I mention that the call for speakers for C++ and C open the thing? <laughs> hmm. So what do you think about uh, 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 jolly old England? <laughs> I love England. Uh, which which part of Maybe. England are uh, on the sea? Right on the coast. Doesn't sound it right doesn't on like it's on the water. Yeah, yes, right uh, on the channel. Folkestone near um near Dover, White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, um, let's see. Have I been there? No, I don't think I've been there. Um, we need to change that. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk yeah. after the show. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm being invited, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so right. yeah, we well, are we are running a bit long. Um, right. Just picking up the topic of the uh, software technology labs. Uh, I know you and Sean did go into that in a bit more depth on uh, CPP Cast recently, so we'll hmm. put a link to to that episode in the show notes as well. Um, I imagine most of our listeners have, have heard that one anyway, but uh, I'll put that in there, um, and that will get us off hook from having to talk for another two hours about it. <laughs> I'll talk all day if you like. <laughs> That's that's my problem. We can't. Uh, I love to. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with not, um, not editing your shows. That's right. If right. Um, if anybody does want to talk with you about it all day, uh, they can join us in Aspen, and we can yeah. we can have a long discussion about that. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, and folks can apparently. drag Sean along to that. Yes, right. <laughs> All right. Well, we should probably. Is there anything else we need to cover before we uh, say goodbye, Phil? Um, there, there's probably lots of things we need to cover, but um, we never do. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good. Uh, so I'll just uh, invite you, you both to. Uh, that's right. Um, invite you to to join me in wishing the entire audience safe coding. So, safe coding, everybody. Safe coding, everybody. Safe coding. You're gonna need it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>